afternoon. Um, my name is David Adelstein. I'm a member of the faculty in the Law School of Foreign Service as well as the Department of Government. I also currently serve as chair of the School of Foreign Service faculty. And it is really my um, distinct pleasure and honor to be able to welcome uh, Joseph and I here today to talk with us. Um, just one uh, quick reminder before we get started, if you haven't already turned off your cell phone, please, please do so. Uh, and then just also a, another note that um, the event is being audio, audio recorded for a podcast and <coughs> photographed, so just so that you're aware of that. Um, Joseph Nye uh, probably needs a little introduction to many of you, but I will do it anyway. Um, I think in, in many ways, Professor Nye captures the spirit we talk about so much around here of theory and practice. In fact, it's hard to think of anybody who has better sort of captured the notion of, of crossing back and forth between theory and practice. Um, professor Nye is a University Distinguished Service Professor at Harvard University, a former Dean of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Uh, he has been mm -hmm. from Princeton University, did graduate work at Oxford University on a Rhodes Scholarship, uh, and er earned a PhD in the Government Department from Harvard. Uh, in the government, he's served as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, the Chair of the National Intelligence Council, and Deputy Undersecretary of State for Security, Assistance, Science, and Technology. So that's sort of on the practice side. On the, the theory side, uh, the most recent TRIP survey, which is the theory, the survey that they do of international relations scholars across the country and ask about who particularly in, are influential in the academy. Uh, Professor Nye was, was ranked and rated as the sixth most influential um, IR scholar in the last 20 years. He's the author of numerous books and articles. Uh, I would highlight two sort of contributions in particular that I think he's made to the academic study of international affairs. <coughs> Uh, the first one was work he did uh, with Robert Cohane on power and interdependence uh, in the 1970s that I think in many ways defined sort of a research agenda within political economy and um, the notion of complex interdependence which really sort of drove people to think about interactions between states uh, in the 1970s and, and going forward even until today. Um, and then the second contribution uh, we all we all dream of coining concepts that have labels that actually stick in international politics. And in the study of international politics, academics kind of dream of these things. Um, and I'd say there are a few concepts, few labels that have had the, the kind of impact and staying power is that of soft power, um, which uh, Professor Nye sort of, uh, has written a lot on and, um, and provoked many of us to think about what is this concept of soft power uh, and just how important is it uh, both relative to hard power and on its own in an absolute sense. Um, finally, before I, I turn the floor over, if I can just um, sort of one quick personal note. Um, when I was an undergraduate, uh, there, were, there were two books that I can say really had a formative uh, effect on me and probably largely explained why I'm here today. Um, one of them was Ken Waltz's Man the State of War, uh, and the other one, which with Man the State of War, I, I truly devoured as an undergraduate was was power and interdependence. I got my, my copy off the shelf that goes back to my undergraduate days. Um, I've never had an opportunity to thank Professor Nye, but I guess I'll take it now, right? Because he said that I, I truly wouldn't be here if it weren't for the effect that, that his work had on me, and I think I'd probably speak for many of the other um, people in this room. So um, he's going to speak for, he told us about roughly half an hour today on um, his new book project. Um, which uh, the title given the talk here is Presidents and the Creation of the American Era. So please join me in welcoming the Professor. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, David. That's a very generous introduction, the kind that only my mother would believe. <laughs> <laughs> I should say, usually when people tell me they've read my books, I apologize. <laughs> my father, who never graduated from <laughs> so for all of you who have suffered that part of it, right? I, I what I would like to talk about is, oh, it's not on, so I'm, so I'm not protected. 
Thank you. Okay. Is that, can you hear me in the back now? Okay. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to talk about this afternoon is the book that is going to be published in uh, May, May 1st, by Princeton Press, the Cole Press Center for Leadership for the Creation of the American Era. And uh, it, it's a book which I, uh, it's a little bit different. It's a book of what you might call counterfactual history. And it's an effort to answer some <coughs> questions that have been uh, puzzling all through, which is, to what extent do leaders matter? If you look at the, at the position that the United States had by the end of the 20th century, um, it was really quite an extraordinary position in the sense that we had the, um, about half the world's defense expenditure, so nobody could effectively balance our power in the military sense. We had about a quarter of the world's economy, and with our universities and Hollywood and so forth and entertainment industries, we had the primary sources of uh, cultural soft power. Uh, it was an extraordinary situation which, uh, if we believe international relations theory, is very rare. Unbalanced power. Or the fact that you had a, a pre preeminent power of that sort. I call that American primacy. There are lots of words people bandy about. Is this hegemony, empire, and so forth. Sometimes most of those words just confuse us. In fact, if we just look at this fact that one country had <coughs> its great imbalance of power and resources, Here's an interesting puzzle, which is, did it matter who was president? Or was it all just in the cards? Uh, suppose that uh, you had different presidents than the ones we had. Uh, would we all have turned out at about the same position at the end of the century or not? Well, in international relations theory, uh, the general tendency is to use structural explanations. So, you know, it's all, it's all in the cards. Basically, it doesn't matter too much who was president. It may not matter at all. Um, if you read Ken Waltz, uh, not, not The Man Who Saved the War, which I think is a great book, A Theory of International Politics, which I thought he lost the richness of his earlier work. But if you read the, if you read Theory of International Politics, it's all structured, and nothing else matters. And uh, I think that's, I've always felt that doesn't quite capture the reality of international politics. <coughs> It's interesting that uh, uh, it, it, when Henry Kissinger was teaching as a realist at Harvard in the 60s, he basically said it's all structured. And then after he went to Washington as National Security Advisor and Secretary of State, he changed his mind. <laughs> so what you, what you think on this question, of the leaders matter, may be one of those things where you stand depends on where you're sitting at a particular time. But uh, it also raises another puzzle for our discipline, which is leadership theory. And you know, there's the question of international relations theory. You said it's all structure. We say that individuals matter sometimes. Uh, what do we do with leadership theory? What, what, how do we parse this? And when you look at leadership theory, which I tried to look at in the book uh, a few years ago called The Powers to Lead, um, which I should say grew out of my time as spending uh, as a dean. So I, I, uh, I sympathize with Ruth and Carol. Uh, but that idea of telling people about leading led me to sit down and try to write a book about it. And in leadership theory, I discovered that there were really, uh, since James McGregor Burns' book on leadership in 1978, the whole theory has been about the distinction between what the theorists call transactional and transformational leaders. And a transformational leader is one who raises the people to a higher level with a new vision and uh, something major change really takes place. And a transactional leader is simply a manager, you know, gets the trains to run on time, the classroom bells to ring when the time comes and so forth. And there's a, uh, uh, a strong tendency in the popular press, and editorialists, and elsewhere to say transformational leaders are great. Transactional leaders, you know, you give them the back of the hand, they, you know, they're 
time that doesn't don't matter. So in this new book, what I've done is that what's going on when we have leadership theory saying one thing is that leaders make a huge difference if they're transformational, and we have international relations theory says it doesn't matter at all whether they're leaders; it's all structural, or putting it back in Waltz's terms of man mistake for war. It's all from uh, from the international structural fears. It's all model three or image three. And uh, for the leadership theory people, it's all image one, the, you know, the great man or great woman. Probably most of these would be great men because it was, alas, only men who were available for presidencies in that time. So that will change. But in any case, what I'm interested in is to ask, how do you, how do you reconcile <coughs> these two bodies of theory? And what occurred to me was, well, maybe if you go back and look carefully at the 20th century and ask about the periods of the growth in American privacy, and then ask which presidents mattered in terms of this growth, and imagine what would have been like if the most likely alternative had been president instead. So you, you ask in a counterfactual way, you know, what if this person hadn't been president, but the other most likely person had been present, would it have made a difference? And uh, if you look at the period, you know, that the structuralists would explain away that doesn't make any difference, mm -hmm. there is at least a, 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 an anomaly or a puzzle that you have to answer, which is if it's all structural, if it's just as the American economy grew, you know, with our vast continent, our resources, two oceans to protect us, weak neighbors, if this was just inevitable, then it ought to be relatively monotonic. It ought to be a pretty smooth rise upward. Because the Americans are actually about a quarter of the world's product by 1900, the beginning of the 20th century. And they're about a quarter of the world's product at the end of the 20th century. And in between, we go up very high, nearly half, uh, with the end of World War II, not because of our change, but because of essentially everybody else is laid low by World War II. And then as the others recover, we return more to that quarter that we've had. But you ought to see then, uh, if it's all structural, it ought to reflect that. You ought to see a rise of American preeminence in terms of world politics, you know, controlling things. But that's not the way it looks. What you find is that from 1900 to 1920, the Americans do as their economy is growing, play an increasingly important role in world politics. But then you have an anomaly. From 1920 to 1940, as our economy continues to grow and become more important, we actually become less important in world politics, a period of isolationism. And then with World War II, we become important again uh, for the reasons I mentioned. But I would make an argument that the period from 1960, oh, let's say 66 or so, the, the Vietnam and post-Vietnam period, we actually play less of a role. In other words, that if you graph this, we're going down rather than up. And then in 1980s, we start to play more of a role again, till by the end of the century, we're the only superpower. So if it were all structural, you still, you'd have to explain these, <coughs> there are these, these periods when, you're, when it wasn't a smooth monotonic increase. And so that's an argument at a broad level why leaders might <coughs> play a role. But it seemed to me that you needed more than that. You needed to look, as I said, at presidents in finer grain, the ones who presided over the periods when the American era was uh, expanding and then ask what they did and what would have happened if the most likely alternative had been present. So um, I see four periods in the expansion of the American era. There's uh, the entry into global politics, which starts basically with the beginning of the century with Teddy Roosevelt and goes to 1920. There's the entry into World War II There's the permanent presence abroad, which is uh, different. That's the period of containment after World War II. In other words, after World War I, we went in, then we came home. After World War II, we went in, but 
didn't come home. And that fact that the Americans stayed overseas was extraordinarily important. And uh, you know, if you go back to George Washington, though, the Tangling Alliances, we, in that period, created an alliance called NATO, which is with us today, uh, if that many decades later. And so that, I would argue, was the third period. In fact, it's obviously Truman uh, who initiated containment, and the Eisenhower who really assisted in that period. Uh, then the fourth period of the creation of the American era, since I see, I see the Vietnam period as a setback rather than a, than a increase, um, would be the collapse of the Soviet Union and the uh, end of the Cold War, leaving the Americans forgetting. Uh, so that's the, those, are the, the, those are the events that I'm trying to look at when I look at, at the presence associated with that. So I can take you through presence, and we can talk more about it in q and A. I'm going to try to keep this brief so we have most of our time for Q&A. Um, 1900 to 1920, which is really the era of Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, interrupted by it four years of William Howard Taft, but basically it's the Roosevelt, Teal, uh, Wilson period. Um, and TR, who's one of my, uh, oh, well, I might first note how similar these presidents were and how different. They were both Ivy League educated, both people who wrote a lot, both people who won Nobel Prizes for what they did in office. So they're striking similarities, but very, very different in their approach to world politics and how they saw the American world. Anyway, TR uh, is famous for having created the American, or recreated the American Navy, um, maybe for having seized the Panama Canal, which uh, eventually <coughs> led us to be able to shift our Navy between two oceans without going <coughs> around the, the, uh, the Navy. Um, he mediated the Russo-Japanese War uh, and uh, kept the balance of power in East Asia. He got himself involved in a European balance But as Henry Kissinger points out, he didn't educate the American public. He basically, you know, when he was involved in Morocco, he kept that quiet, even from the Congress. It was not a winning position to be involved in the balance of power. You know. And he didn't, he, he was quite happy to follow, educate the American public in the traditions of the Monroe Doctrine. The Americans dominate the Western Hemisphere. There's nothing new about that. That really goes back to the early parts of the 19th century. But he didn't bring along the public uh, in terms of seeing America as a global power. And in Kissinger's book on diplomacy, if you look at the second <coughs> chapter, which is really an extraordinary chapter comparing Wilson and uh, Roosevelt, TR, um, Kissinger says that, oddly, uh, by the time he, Kissinger, was in office under Nixon, he thought that uh, Woodrow Wilson had more influence on Richard Nixon than Teddy Roosevelt. And I think that's an interesting point. Another way of putting it is that Teddy Roosevelt did these things, but they probably would have happened anyway. This, they probably, most of the explanation for America's increasing role in global politics in the first decade or so of the, of the 20th century uh, is, I think, largely structural. I mean, the timing might have been different if you hadn't met TR. And Taft showed that. I mean, Taft, uh, you know, slowed things down a bit. But even under Taft, you still had this stroke. And then you have Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson does something which is quite extraordinary. It brings the United States into a major war in Europe, whereas our legacy since Washington after has been, has been don't involve, get involved in the conflicts in Europe. And two million Americans went overseas. And then he does something that's even more important and more interesting. He explains the reason for going into this war and sending all these Americans to fight overseas in very moralistic terms of American exceptionalism. Teddy Roosevelt was also in favor 
of entering the war in Europe. He was in favor of entering it on pure balance of power terms. But he was never able to sell the American people that balance of power was a good thing. Wilson attacked the balance of power, saw it as immoral, said that he treats nations like cheeses and divided up the concerns of the, of the great powers. Uh, and he was going to replace it. That's what the 14 points were about. So Wilson brings the American public into World War I, a huge departure from tradition, which Roosevelt had departed from, and does it in a, with a major effort to reform the world, the world, reform the way world politics is played, which is this collective security doctrine. And that, of course, is embodied in the League of Nations. And many of the compromises that Wilson made at Versailles, uh, which also often came back to haunt him, such as the self-determination problems that left Czechoslovakia, uh, the uh, Sudeten German problem, and left Poland with a, with a uh, advancing uh, uh, German problem, and so forth. Uh, these were compromises that Wilson made because he was going to solve it all by getting his lead. In other words, once you got the lead, you could repair the compromises he had to make with Orlando and Lloyd George <coughs> at Versailles. But then when he gets back home and tries to sell the American Congress on his lead, uh, he wants it to be pure. He wants the lead to be just the way he wrote it. It was going to repair all these things. And of course, the uh, Senate didn't take it very well. And Wilson then, uh, in his battle with Henry Cabot Lodge, but uh, with other senators, goes on this famous speaking tour in the West. And he's trying to recruit or rally public opinion to educate American public opinion to this new world order that he's creating. And he has a stroke. And one of the great ironies of history is that the stroke that killed Woodrow Wilson, rather than just debilitated him, the United States probably would have entered the war. Because there was a middle group of Democrats and Republican moderates who were willing to go for a league with some very minor reservations. And Earl Grey, the Lord Grey, former British foreign minister, even came to the US and pleaded with Wilson to let the United States join the league with these reservations, which Wilson said the Allies wouldn't tolerate. And Wilson said, no, we're, we're, it's all or nothing. And that essentially <coughs> meant the Americans didn't ratify, the Senate didn't ratify the league. And that laid the basis for this enormous reaction against the Wilsonian approach, which characterized the 1930s. A little less so in the 20s, but he, I mean, when Harding brings us back to normalcy, but strongly in the 1930s. In other words, having used this moralistic appeal and then failed, he sets the scene for a backlash in the 30s, which creates a tremendous problem for, uh, for Franklin. So if you'd had a different president, for example, if Teddy Roosevelt had won in 1912, or if Teddy Roosevelt hadn't run in 1912, Woodrow Wilson would never have been president. In other words, Woodrow Wilson became president because TR split the Republican vote. And that meant that you might have, Americans might have gone into World War I anyway under TR or under Taft, but they would not have had this moralistic which led to the reaction, which led to the isolation of the 1930s. Now, if you look at the 1930s, the second period of American expansion, or all those late 30s, um, Franklin Roosevelt uh, is the key leader. And there, uh, it's worth noticing that Franklin Roosevelt from 1933 to late 1938 is not at all interested in foreign affairs. I mean, he was interested in domestic affairs. He had a progression of uh, huge unemployment. I mean, he was, he just, foreign affairs was on his agenda. But in 1938, uh, particularly after the Munich Agreement uh, and Kristallnacht uh, in uh, Germany, FDR decides, you know, Hitler is going to be a threat to us as well. And then he says, I've got to prepare the American people to combat this threat. And interestingly enough, he, he, he 
we all think of Roosevelt with his fireside chats and his enormous persuasiveness. We think of him giving great speeches. And stuff. That's not what he did at all. He, as Bunsen once said to one of his aides, he said, what do you do if you're a leader and you look over your shoulder and there are no followers? <laughs> and he was concerned. He had seen the threat of Hitler, but the American people were still reacting to Woodrow Wilson. And the net effect is that Franklin Roosevelt then wound up trying to deceive the American people into something uh, which was getting into this war. And every time he would take a little step, he'd run into public, and then he'd draw back. He was not giving great visionary speeches. He was inch by inch. And when he bumped into something, he'd turn around. And in that sense, uh, uh, I mean, he even he even tried to create incidents which were and lied about them as a way to get the American people to see this. There's a famous incident of the destroyer Greer, American destroyer in the uh, Atlantic, North Atlantic, and uh, Roosevelt thought the way the Americans will learn is if an American ship is attacked, then then we'll really rise to the occasion. Of course, that's how we got into World War One, and so he forced the American. German U-boat had attacked the USS Greer. In fact, as historians now know, it was just the opposite. The USS Greer attacked the U-boat first. Uh, but Roosevelt was not above lying to the American public to try to get those people, when he looked around over his shoulder, to be following him. But even that didn't work. And it wasn't until Pearl Harbor that Roosevelt was finally unleashed. Now, there are some historians, but not many, who say Pearl Harbor was also a setup. In fact, it's, that's pretty well discredited among historians now. But what Roosevelt did is when Pearl Harbor occurred, he was ready and he prepared people to be ready. We'd been building up our military capacity. We had <coughs> had a draft so that we had so many military people trained. We were increasing our armaments and then Roosevelt found ways transfer some of these military capacities to Europe, to Britain, under lend lease and other things, which again, misleading and called it's like lending your neighbor a garden hose, but nobody was going to get this back after the war. Roosevelt did that, but the others did. He even sent troops to Iceland, American Marines to Iceland, and people would say, what? How can that be? So Iceland's part of the Western Hemisphere. So <laughs> Roosevelt did everything possible to get ready. And then when the Japanese attacked at Pearl Harbor and Hitler made the mistake of declaring war on the US in support of a Japanese ally, Roosevelt was there <coughs> and ready. And of course, after December 11th, uh, yeah, December 4th, 7th, 1941, he unleashed his rhetoric as well. So Roosevelt essentially made some key decisions. And you say, well, suppose that he had been defeated in 19. Well, the most likely alternative was uh, uh, <coughs> his, his, his Republican opponent was an internationalist. So that probably wouldn't have made such a difference. But if, if you stretch it a bit and you look at Philip Roth's novel, The Plot Against America, now imagine that the Republicans had, in, had, had nominated um, a Charles Lindbergh, a hero who was a rabid isolationist, would Lindbergh have reacted the same way? Possibly not. He certainly wouldn't have made the preparations. And Bruce Russett at Yale has written an interesting book laying the case for a realist basis for staying out of World War II. So if you'd had a Lindbergh presidency instead of an FDR presidency, it's conceivable that we would have stayed out too late and would have been left with a very messy, multipolar world of reaction. Now, after World War II, you had Harry Truman. And Harry Truman uh, made a huge difference in the sense that he first tried to implement Roosevelt's grand design, uh, but the world didn't fit that. And by 1947, he realizes that he can't implement Roosevelt's UN design. And so he 
policy is contained in. And uh, that basically means the Marshall Plan and the recovery of Europe, as well as the uh, <coughs> important step of uh, creating NATO. Now, suppose that had to switch by presidents. Suppose that instead of switching Henry Wallace, the uh, Midwestern pacifist pro-Soviet, uh, he had uh, uh, left Wallace in place. Uh, how would Wallace have responded in that period of 45 to 47? Probably not the way Truman did. He probably would have been much, made much more effort to accommodate the Soviets. He wouldn't have had some people would say that's better. We wouldn't have had a Cold War. I think we would have had a Cold War anyway. That's more than we can argue in this short time now. But the point is, Harry Truman's presence, President Henry Wallace's, made a difference. But containment wasn't solidified because in 1952, in that election, which brought Dwight Eisenhower to the presidency, there was a fair <coughs> chance that the Republicans were going to nominate Robert Taft, who was also an isolation. And whether Taft would have kept American troops in Europe, would have had the same sort of uh, emphasis behind the Marshall Plan, uh, much more questionable. Indeed, Eisenhower says the reason he ran was so that Taft didn't reverse the policies of American involvement. So Eisenhower gives us, in the 1950s, eight years of peace. Um, and what he did was consolidate Truman's policy containment. In 1952 election, there were some Republicans who were running against what they called the cowardly college of containment. That is the people who wanted a roll back, particularly in Asia. The full iteration was the cowardly college, the uh, yeah. college of cowardly communist containment. Okay. Which was, and the dean of which was Atchison. <laughs> the, uh, but the, the other wing of the Republicans wanted a, a, a very different approach. They wanted to come back. They wanted to come back as we did in the 1920s. And that was the Taft thing. And Eisenhower ran a solarium exercise early in his presidency to bring his administration to a consensus on containment. Interestingly enough, he didn't, he, he didn't run this to educate himself. He ran it to educate his inner core followers as to what or in doing it, fill in the guys of educating himself. And Eisenhower then, in producing these eight years of peace, consolidated this idea that the Americans should remain abroad, that it wasn't going to be too expensive, it wasn't going to be like World War I. But he didn't do it with a lot of moralism with the Wilsonian sort, it was in a rather practical sense. And he made some crucial decisions during that period, one of which was in uh, 1954, when the French were being defeated by the North Vietnamese at Dien Bien Phu. Uh, Eisenhower refused to go in to save the French. Uh, and the reason, in his words, was not that he was pro-communist, that's the last thing you'd say about Eisenhower, or even that he didn't care about the French. It was that he said, if we go in there, it will swallow our armies by the divisions. And so he had the sense to stay out where Jack Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson didn't. And the other thing that Eisenhower did that was extremely important was he refused to use nuclear weapons. He, he would use them to bluff, for example, in ending the Korean War. But when Admiral Radford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, came to Eisenhower and said, if we nuke them, We'll win this in Vietnam. He said no. And then later, when you had the so called Kimon Matsu Island problems off the coast of China, um, and again, Eisenhower gets a recommendation that we should use nuclear weapons. And Eisenhower says, You must be crazy. We can't use those things on Asians again. It was a very strong and principled stand. And imagine what history would have looked like. Either the NBF food or the nuclear recommendations. <coughs> so I would argue that Truman and Eisenhower consolidated that third phase of the creation of the American era. 
Then I think we lost our way with the Vietnam War and the aftermath of the Vietnam War. But if things start to change again, what I call the fourth phase of integration in the American era, uh, and the end of the Cold War, with the Reagan administration. And there's a lot of controversy of how much does Reagan get credit, what's he get credit for. And I think the great danger is that sometimes people say Reagan ended the Cold War. You know, he talked tough and the wall fell down, like Joshua the Battle of Jericho or something. It, uh, it wasn't that at all. The person who gets the most credit for the end of the Cold War when it ended was Mikhail Gorbachev, mm -hmm. who was a transformational leader who wanted to transform the Soviet Union. And he did, just not the way he intended. He intended to save it, not the way that he destroyed it. But the real underlying causes of the end of the Soviet Union were structural. The Soviet economy couldn't cope with the third industrial revolution, the information revolution. And Gorbachev thought that by trying to make reforms of perestroika and Glasnost, he could reform the Soviet Union. All he did was speed it up in terms of its collapse. Or another counterfactual was if Andropov, the mm -hmm. tough as nails KGB leader who became secretary of too for him. Um, uh, if Andropov had had real kidneys, he died of kidney failure. Uh, the Cold War and the Soviet Union could have lasted another 10 or 15 years. So Reagan was lucky in this, that he was dealt the hand by history called Mikhail Gorbachev. But with that said, Reagan gets the credit for seeing that he could deal with Gorbachev. And well ahead of the other parts of his administration, he sees this and begins to deal with Gorbachev. Reagan gets credit as well for a tough position, for defense spending, the press, the Soviet system, and so forth. I don't think that, if Andropov had been general secretary, I don't think that would have done the trick. But I think that the fact that Reagan, Reagan was <coughs> a brilliant leader, he talked it tough and then compromised. And he, and he did this in domestic and I think that was Reagan's uh, uh, genius, if you want. So Reagan lays the groundwork by working with Gorbachev, seeing Gorbachev. You could say, well, suppose that Reagan had not defeated Jimmy Carter. And suppose that Carter had been reelected in 1980. It was a close call. I mean, in, in the early part of 1980, Carter was ahead. It looked like he would be reelected. If Reagan, if Carter had been and everything else had played out um, so that Carter got dealt the hand of Gorbachev. Of course, it wouldn't have happened for Carter. It would have been the president after Carter, you know, the Soviet got deaths from the same sequence. Uh, he probably still would have had the speeding up at the end of the Cold War because Gorbachev. So I think uh, the question of did Reagan make a difference? Yes, but not as much as the people who think who say he talked tough and the wall fell down. He made a difference because in talking tough and watching the beginnings of crumbling, he knew how to strike a bargain. And not many of the people who talk about even Reaganite foreign policy today understand what a Reaganite foreign policy is. And if you want to, if you don't believe me, read the books by Jack Matlock, who was Reagan's key advisor on, on social affairs, professional foreign civil service. Mm -hmm. So finally, we come to the end of just the end of the Cold War, but at the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, and that occurs under the first Bush, Bush 41, I call it. Um, and the thing that uh, is interesting about Bush 41 is he, in his words, doesn't have the vision thing. He deliberately says, it's not me, I don't do vision. And he, uh, but he has a superb sense And so if you look at the foreign policy process of the Bush administration, with Baker and Cheney and Scowcroft, it's an extremely well-managed foreign policy process. In addition to that, Bush has a sense of how to handle the collapsing Soviet Union, which if he hadn't had this sense, could have been a real mess. The idea that you could get the reunification of Germany inside NATO with Soviet permission 
the Soviets had their troops on the ground in Berlin. This is, this is an extraordinary accomplishment. And it's interesting, when the wall came down in November 1989, uh, Bush is told by some of his political advisors, we've got to get out there and claim credit. We've got to, you know, this has been a 40 years, we won, we got to get out there and claim it. And Bush said, no, I'm not going to dance on the wall. Instead, a month later, he goes to Malta for his summit with Gorbachev and begins a process for the orderly dismantling of the Soviet Empire. An extraordinary act of self-restraint. No big speeches, no transformational meetings. Straightforward, uh, practical bargaining. So that then brings me in conclusion to the question of did leadership matter? And if so, were transformational leaders more important than transactional leaders? And I have came to a conclusion, which I would not have expected before doing this research, that about half the leaders mattered, but not the ones you'd think. Uh, that it was the transactional leaders that mattered as much as some of the trans transformational leaders. Harry, Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman, transformational, though not at the not in their initial parts of their administration, became transformational on the job. Very important to the creation of America. But equally important were Dwight Eisenhower and Bush 41, who were not transformational at all in their style or their objectives. They were very much status quo in their objectives and not very charismatic in their style. And if you think about it, uh, when you look back at history and you ask what might how might history otherwise have turned out, it's just as important to look at what Sherlock Holmes called the dogs that don't bark as the dogs that do. And we spend so much of our time, either in press editorials or in some popularized histories, looking at barking dogs, brilliant leaders who make fancy speeches, that we forget that good managers who avoid terrible mistakes, like nuclear weapons at the end of the end or like dancing on the Berlin Wall just before the summit of Malta, uh, make a huge difference in how history turns out. So in that sense, if we ask what are the lessons of this, it's that we shouldn't privilege transformation people over transactional leaders. Woodrow Wilson was a transformational leader with, I would argue, disastrous consequences. Mikhail Gorbachev was a, disaster, was a disastrous of the Soviet Union. So I think we have to be much more careful as we try to merge leadership theory and international relations theory. We have to be careful not to leave them out, as the IR theorists do, but when we bring them in, be much more careful about which kinds of leaders doing which kinds of things. And that takes a careful look at history. So if we look at the lessons of this in the 21st century, uh, I think it might be summarized by the difference between uh, Bush 41 Bush 43 had a vision. He was a transformational leader. And it's just 10 years ago this month, of course, that, he, that took us into Iraq. Uh, Bush 41 had no vision, but was a superb manager. Now, in an ideal world, we would like to have future geneticists own for us <laughs> presidents who have the managerial skills of a Bush 41 and the rhetorical skills of Wilson, you know, they both able to manage and, and so But unfortunately, uh, we know that that's not yet on the scene genetically. <laughs> and from what we know about natural experience of genetics, there have been no two presidents who will share more of their genes than the two Bushes. And there you'll see that you haven't solved it by nature. Uh, <laughs> so I think the lesson for us in the 21st century is that we've got to pay much more attention to the details how leaders manage processes and not to worry so much about transformational rhetoric and the charismatic dimensions, and much more about understanding the context in which the United States finds itself as power and adjusting the practical senses to that. Uh, and that's what I conclude in this book. I'm not sure that all historians are going to like it. I know some will, but scientists won't like it. But I had an awful lot of fun writing it. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, uh, uh, an expert on the American era. Yeah, uh, a, a, gr a great, great talk, great concept for a book. I mean, we're, we're also used to repetitive treatments of the, um, the triad of IR theories and so on, which just explore old ground. Uh, very provocative, very rich. Let me push you on a small counterfactual mm -hmm. and then a bigger 21st century question. The counterfactual mm -hmm. is um, the, um, uh, the Bill Wolforth in his work quotes a Politburo mm -hmm. transcript in which Gorbachev is saying to the Politburo around 85 or so that we can't keep up with this and we have to change our policies. Now imagine if um, Carter had been reelected instead of Reagan and there had not been Star Wars, which was 30 years short of being technologically feasible and the defense buildup, whether um, because of this, it strengthened Gorby against the hardliners. He was able to say, look, I'm pushing the third world. The conflict orientation isn't working. We've got to change our plan. So that's, that's one item. The bigger item is about the uh, 21st century. Um, in the book I did last year, I argued that we have, it, it was a combination of structure and agency, that contrary to the declinist arguments, the U.S. still has the material or structural strengths but the key to what's going to take place about whether the American era continues is really at the ideational, i.e., agency level. I'd be curious about your reaction to that, but first about the, the counterfactual. Well, starting, let me take them in order. Um, I, I don't want to belittle Reagan. I'm just trying to get a balance. I think Reagan's, in the first term, Reagan's uh, tough talk and his expansion of the defense budget did make some difference caught the attention of the other side. It wasn't just Gorbachev. Uh, Marshal Ogarkov was the head of the Soviet military. And he said, <clears throat> it doesn't matter whether this Star Wars thing works or not. The problem is that we can't, ex we can't spend that much. We don't, don't have the resources to spend. The Soviet Union was then spending about, I don't know, 22% by some estimates, more by others of their GDP on the military. That's, that's true imperial overstretch, which uh, Paul Kennedy got wrong and thought it affected us. It was really the Soviets who had the imperial overstretch problem. So in that sense, Reagan's pushing did play a role. Um, and I think that uh, uh, then you have to do the counterfactual. Suppose that if Carter hadn't been reelected, he had already, Carter had already taken some steps such as the embargo against the Soviets after the invasion of Afghanistan. And he was toughening his positions. He probably wouldn't have gone for a, uh, a Star Wars uh, type position, but he would have increased the defense budget and taken a somewhat tougher position. Now, would that have led to the kind of uh, uh, concern in the Soviet military? Probably not the same degree. I mean, Reagan's rhetoric did I guess what I was trying to argue is that uh, it, it, Reagan's real genius was knowing how to combine uh, hard and soft. So there's how to put the two pieces together. Mm -hmm. The question that I think you'd have to ask the counterfactual is if Carter had been in place, um, we're off by a year or two because Carter would have been until 84 and we would have had X, whoever the successor would be, uh, when Gorbachev comes in. So Carter would have had to be. So in that sense, it, it's simple counterfactual of Carter is in his position. But suppose that uh, suppose that uh, uh, Fritz Mondale had been taken, had followed Carter. Suppose the Democrats had not been uh, thrown out uh, by '85. I think you probably could have still seen a Gorbachev who was who was trying to change the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. In other words, he he and Shevardnadze talked together. They and they, they'd spent a fair amount of time with Jakob Bolser, who had been a student in the United States. Um, um, and they say, we're falling behind. You're not, we're not keeping up as an industrial nation. So I think they would have still done perestroika, which was to restructure the Soviet bureaucracy. And then when perestroika didn't work, then they unleashed Glasnost, which was open discussion. And when you open discussion, what people said is we want out. I think that probably would have happened. 
um, whether they would have, uh, whether it would have happened quite as fast, uh, not sure. But the, so the counterfactual is a difficult one. But I think, I think what I what I'm trying to do in this book is to make people say it's not just. Uh, and what he did was essentially sit down and do a series of bargains for the firm. Now, the, on your second point, uh, since you and I tend to agree about mm -hmm. the United States not being in decline, I can't disagree much with what you said. I think the, I don't, I, I think uh, that the, we're not going to recover the American era of the 20th century. Uh, you are seeing the rise of the rest, but I don't see any absolute. National Intelligence Council <coughs> wrote in their 2030 report that by 2030 the Americans will still be uh, the most powerful nation uh, it will likely be true. If we got into our head somehow that that we were in decline and the problem was to manage decline, we could turn we could make that worse. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's your ideation of the point. Uh, well, you and I agree on this, so we're <laughs> we can't get into a good argument. <laughs> Other. Uh, Questions? Yes. Uh, how would a future president who accepted your argument run for office? Because it seems like these days you have to run as if you were a transformational leader. You know, so looking forward to you know, 2016 or 2020, is there a way in which a president who, presidential candidate who thought that transitional leadership was probably the most important thing, is, 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 a, way, is a way for them to run for for office on that platform, or would they have to pretend they were a transformational leader, well, I as think, I think some yeah. candidates have? I think you do have to pretend you're transformational in the campaign. Yeah. Even Eisenhower in 1952 uh, called his campaign a crusade. Uh -huh. uh, but, okay. you know, it was a crusade. It was change America to bring back America to its strength and its reality. Okay. Because an out, a, a candidate from an out party has to say things are terrible now. Change, and I will bring you, and change is transformation. So I think the dynamics of, 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 of competition in the democracy are likely to lead to campaigns that are transformational. But look at the first, um, look at the first term of Barack Obama. Uh, I think you can make a case that his rhetoric in 2008 was transformational. Sure. He's gonna make a huge difference. He gives a series of speeches in his first year that you know, rid the world of nuclear weapons and so forth, transformational. I would not argue that he had a transformational first term in foreign policy. Mm -hmm. He had a relatively modest right. first term. Now, you can either say that's good or that's bad. I would say that's good. In other words, it, it's a little bit like what I said about Reagan. I mean, Reagan had a rhetoric, but when he got to actually doing things, he knew how to, how to manage things. So I don't, I, I think, it, and, it, and it's also fair that when we talk about transformational and, and transactional, they're really, they're not dichotomous, either or. Right. What you have is points on a spectrum from, from pure status quo to radical change. And, you know, different people adjust on different degrees on that spectrum, including on different issues. Um, so I don't, I mean, I wouldn't say that everything that but but it's not been a it's not been the type of campaign that, as he in his words, to bend the arc of history. Sim similarly, Bush forty one when he ran for re-election might have projected more of a a transformational image or, and actually taken credit for some of the things he'd already done. And I think that's that that's yeah. a problem for Bush forty one, which yeah. is if he had been less modest as a person. Yeah. Um, and uh, been more willing to brag, as he often said, he was brought up not to brag. Yeah. Uh, he might have been able to win the election in, in 92. But uh, he, there's another factor, of course, that it's the economy. In other words, if, if right. he hadn't taken a very important decision, uh, which was to get the American House in order in fiscal sense by reversing his minimum taxes pledge, uh, he It's hard to, it's, yeah. uh, but, but certainly Bush, the Bush's characteristics as a leader, his style is very transactional. 
and uh, he, you know, I think that hurt him in getting elected, but it helped him in governing. What's interesting, we, we contrast that with Obama. Obama, his, his style was transformational in his speeches, his rhetoric, <coughs> but when he was actually governing, he was much more managerial. And I would argue that that probably helped Bush to stay out of some, some problems that probably were good to stay out of. I am uh, John Aston, a senior in the School of Foreign Service. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, your your lecture in, in addressing the transformational and transactional uh, kinds of leadership has implicitly addresses uh, the bureaucratic nature of government. Mm -hmm. And so I want to ask about the sits and stands problem vis-a-vis -vis your views on leadership. So even a president to come in with uh, transformational ideals or, or different policy preferences find that they're pressured by existing policies and bureaucracies to adjust their vision of the world. I think a good example of this might be President Obama's views on Guantanamo Bay, uh, where he comes in with a seemingly very sincere policy agenda that he isn't able to achieve. Um, so how much, how much of the leadership that you've discussed uh, would have really been different, given not just uh, the presidential leadership, but the presidential leadership within the context of those existing bureaucracies? So I think you mentioned a few very specific examples, like the dancing in the Berlin Wall, where one man, one president could have made the difference. But it seems to me that many of the most important changes in American foreign policy are mediated by other preferences and actors besides the president. Yeah, though I wouldn't place the emphasis on so much on the bureaucracies sure. as on the Congress. I think mm -hmm. Congress is, it, it, it is tremendously important. And uh, you know, if you go back to, to the, some of the classic works on American uh, foreign policy and the, the division of powers, uh, let me put it, it's an invitation to struggle. It's not clear in the Constitution who has ultimate power in foreign affairs. And in that sense, uh, I think if you, if, if you imagine Congresses which are different, then you could, I mean, suppose I take your case of Guantanamo. If, um, uh, if Obama had not had resistance from Congress, I think he could have closed Guantanamo. But I think he was sincere. I think he said that in the campaign, but I don't think he sincerely wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. In fact, Attorney General Holder started to take steps down there. Yeah. But the uh, Congress basically prevented it. So I, I think you're right that it's, it, it's a mistake to see it as just one person. Um, and I think the, the Congress plays a, a large role. If you go back to containment, the origins of containment from Harry Truman, um, it's interesting there that uh, uh, Senator Vandenberg played a very important role. And, uh, and you get coalitions like Dean Acheson and Vandenberg working together. Uh, and it's interesting because, you know, within a few years, uh, Acheson was persona non grata with the Republicans who were elected, uh, but Vandenberg was the old style Republican who was quite willing to, to work with them. Uh, <coughs> So it, I think you're right that you don't want to, to, to uh, over-personalize it. In, in the American system, uh, bureaucracies matter and, and the Congress matters. On the bureaucracy, one, one of the things that's worth remembering is that uh, in terms of uh, American entry into the war with Japan, um, Roosevelt basically had given an order in Southeast Asia, he given an order to um, have a partial oil embargo in Japan. And the way that was implemented by the bureaucracy was as a total oil embargo. And Roosevelt wasn't paying adequate attention. So he, in Roosevelt's words, um, you can see this in Robert Dollop's book on Roosevelt's foreign policy, which gives you some detail and so forth. Roosevelt's terms, Roosevelt says, I want to put a noose around the Japanese neck and jerk it every once in a while. So he sees this as coercive diplomacy or to enable deterrence. Instead, the bureaucracy tightened the, the noose and the Japanese said, we're strangling. If we don't attack at Pearl Harbor, you're dead. So there's a case where the bureaucracy really did make a difference. And um, the other case I gave you on 
thing that the Congress made the difference. So yes, it's not just the individual. And uh, that makes leadership in a democracy hard. Mm -hmm. Yes? Thank you, Dr. Talk again. Uh, a somewhat common theme in leadership is that leaders would play against type. So Nixon in China, Reagan Zhu kind of talks, mm -hmm. you know, talks about that, also talks uh, reasonably. How important is that idea of self in leadership? So can presidents be aware of that need to play against type, to kind of play on one side and kind of calm down? Is that entirely relevant? To the well, it does, it does help a leader uh, if your previous positions in your type uh, inoculates you against uh, a strong, powerful uh, group. And so Nixon, um, who had grown up as the staunch anti-communist, was, uh, there was in the, in the Republican Party at the time, a very strong so-called China lobby. The China lobby was actually anti-China. It was mm -hmm. Taiwan right. lobby. Right. It was the people who wanted to keep the government of China and Taiwan, the Republic of China and Taiwan, as China. And um, uh, even, uh, you know, there, there, were, there were very strong opponents, and they were powerful in the Republican Party. But Nixon didn't come from the Eisenhower wing, even though he was Eisenhower's vice president. He'd risen up in California <laughs> as uh, close to Milliman and the other people who were, who were in this, this China lobby. So he had essentially a degree of protection against them by playing against type. Doesn't solve everything, but it, it certainly does make it uh, it make it somewhat easier. Um, and and Nixon played that extremely well, in the sense that I think his what Nixon was doing with the opening of China was reacting to what he and Kissinger saw of American decline. Uh, when you go back and you read. Uh, that literature of the 1970s, 1960s, early 70s, they believed the United States was in decline. And uh, you can see it time and again when things are saying. And the opening to China, they thought the Soviet Union was getting stronger. The <coughs> opening to China was to get a different balance against the Soviet <coughs> Union. Um, and Nixon, I think, played it brilliantly. I mean, I think he did a very good job of that. But it didn't restore the American position. Um, he'd also made another decision at the same time, which is to take the United States uh, dollar off the gold. Or, I mean, make the dollar not convertible into gold, which led to an unleashing of inflation. He broke the breadth of the system without having anything put in its place. And um, um, he did it basically for domestic political reasons with John Conway. In fact, the key decision at uh, Camp David where they made this, which is in, didn't involve Kissinger and didn't involve the Secretary of State Rogers. Uh, it was it was a purely how am I going to get how am I going to win this November election? And uh, so what he did was break the monetary system. And at one point, there's this famous quote: somebody says to Nixon. What about the lira? And he says, I don't give a bleep about the lira. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Nixon, Nixon had some things where he, where he was playing against type, and drew up the strategy that worked very well. He had others where he made a mess. Yes. Hi, Professor Miller. Uh, Samira Daniels. Um, you characterize um, uh, Bush Senior as transactional, and you also a caveat that, you know, there is some crossover, but I've read uh, Jim Baker's, uh, I've read Brent and uh, Brent Scowcroft and Bush's book also, and I come away with a, a slightly different conclusion on, on that, which is <coughs> that, um, you know, knowing a little bit of uh, President Bush, uh, uh, Bush uh, Sr.'s history, that is his, 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 his career, that there are very strong elements um, of, uh, of an ideological bent and, 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 and actually a, a, a sense of transformation. It comes through particularly in uh, that um, uh, you know, account written by Brent and right. um, that you know, they wanted to, to, to spread freedoms and you know, do away with authoritarianism and so forth. So you know, I think that 
you you would be correct to say that because of uh, uh, his career trajectory <coughs> that he had more management experience. But I think that uh, you know at base, uh, you know he came out of that Hartford Seminary, uh, you know, uh, background mm -hmm. and so forth and. Uh, I think that there was this sense for going to spread freedoms and, you know, uh, religious freedoms, intellectual freedoms. I, I saw, I heard a lot more of that in his... I think that's a very fair comment, and, and I don't mean that, uh, uh, I don't mean to caricature Bush or any transactional leader uh, uh, in the sense that um, you can have very strong beliefs. Eisenhower was a staunch anti-communist. A very staunch believer in the American free enterprise system. There is nothing. I mean, being transactional uh, it doesn't mean that you don't have strong ideological or moral views. It means, though, that uh, you're less likely to take big risks for them. You're more likely to to uh, uh, be cautious in the way you play things. I think that is probably uh, you're not. You're, you may have strong beliefs, but you're not making major changes in the status quo. I would say the big exception for Bush 41 was the unification of Germany, where Bush did take the lead yeah, within his administration and within the Western alliance against Stokoff, among yeah, others. Uh, exactly. And so Bush, it was, there was an aspect of Bush's policy which was transformational, and which he deserves credit for that. So as I said earlier, n nobody's purely transformational or purely transactional. But on the scale of, uh, uh, you know, uh, this from transactional or transformational, uh, Bush would be more at the transactional side of the, of the middle. And I think his son, uh, Bush 43, uh, who used to say, I don't play small ball, I'm going to go for the big game changer, uh, and who reacted, I believe, against his father's caution. Uh, that's an example of a, of a, of a, of a very different approach. Um, so it's not it's not totally either or. But uh, and and for Bush forty one, you're right that they did talk about freedom and change and so forth. Remember when after they won the Iraq, the Gulf War and um, they needed to have a vision and they picked up the term a new world order. Well, New World Order, you know where that started with? Gorbachev. <laughs> Gorbachev. <laughs> and it's, it's, so it's not as though they, it's, you know, it's not like Woodrow Wilson that they developed this vision. It's, they were picking up what they could use for their needs at the time. So I, I actually am a great admirer of Bush 41. In other words, I'm, I'm not belittling him in any way. But I, I don't think, I think he would not, uh, and I've talked about this with Brent Scowcroft. I don't think he saw himself as a transformation no, leader. No, I don't think he did. Yeah. Yes. Um, I would like to expand a little bit the scope of discussion, if I may. Yep. Uh, it was mentioned that in your earlier works you dealt a lot with uh, different types of power and leadership, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, uh, is uh, also defined by the actions. Actions need the power. Uh, however, uh, for a leader, it's much more easy demonstrate hard power than soft power today. Uh, don't you think there's a disconnection between the transformation of power and the, uh, the lead transformation of leadership in that sense? Well, I think I, I, um, the ideal leader is one who knows how to combine hard and soft power. I mean, it's not either or. Um, so I think the if you just go for hard power without soft power, you wind up, I think, uh, losing the way of moving people, which is what leading is. It comes from legitimacy. Um, I think one of the problems with, uh, uh, I think one of the, the weaknesses in Eisenhower, for example, was that he didn't do enough motivating the people. Uh, uh, I mean, he could have been even more effective, I think, if he had more ability to use soft power. But I still think that um, if you look at uh, uh, Bush 43, uh, there I think he, he starts out being extra tough, just using hard power. And then when they get into a real mess in Iraq, then in his second inaugural address, he has a, a second inaugural address that sounds like Woodrow Wilson. 
and it's you know the freedom and, and, and so forth. So he tries to repair a lot of that by adding a big dose of soft power, but by then it's too late. It's, he, the public opinion polls show the Americans lost uh, about 30 points of attractiveness in Western <coughs> Europe after the invasion of Iraq. And in Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country in the world, uh, we went from being attractive to 75% of the Indonesians being attractive to only 15% as a result of the invasion of Iraq. You can't just pour on the soft power afterwards and repair that easily. So I think, I think Bush 43 made a mistake of not figuring out how to combine hard and soft effectively. I think Bush 41 might have benefited from a little bit more soft power added into a very effective improvement uh, uh, of hard power. So it may not be just whether you're using hard and soft, it's maybe how you do it. I mean, 40, Bush 41, I think, ran an exceptionally good foreign policy process, one of the best we've seen. I think the Bush 43 ran quite a poor foreign policy process, one of the poorer ones that we've seen. And uh, Bush 41 could have taken that skilled foreign policy process and probably made its whole policy a bit more effective with a bit more soft power. Bush 43, I don't think, uh, could, even after his inaugural, second inaugural address, it was too late to have the soft power rescue uh, the mess that we were in. Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Joe. Uh, two questions for you. The, the first one has to do with whether you looked at how other countries perceive American presidents, right, and whether part of the, the puzzle, part of the equation here is that they actually feel sort of less threatened by a transactional leader as opposed to a transformational leader. That's one hypothesis. The other one is you think about, you know, Obama's famous famous tour of Europe in the summer of 2008, right, and the seeming sort of glee mm -hmm. over somebody who was campaigning as a big transformational leader. So to what extent is sort of external threat perception perhaps influenced by particular leaders? And the second one is, you know, as you know, the, the, the big knock on first image explanations of international politics, or one of the big knocks, has always been <laughs> that it's very easy to tell you kind of ex post, right? You can, you can ex post characterize somebody as right. transactional or transformational, but can you actually predict for us in any way who is going to emerge as transactional or transformational, especially given the incentives to kind of misrepresent themselves in campaigns and all the rest? So I'm wondering if you've given any thought to that. And further, if you've, I think you've perhaps slightly underestimated political science in this. You, know, if you may know one of, the big, one of the, the hot trends right now, I think, is actually looking at not necessarily leadership per se, but individual leaders. So mm -hmm. people like Elizabeth Saunders at GW, um, Hein Gomans and Giacomo Chiosa, who have an award-winning book from right. the award given by this institution, uh, Mike Horowitz at Penn, right, all looking at sort of characteristics of individual leaders as a way of predicting how they might behave internationally. So I'm just wondering if you've looked at any of that and if you think it sort of connects to what you're doing. Well, I think those are, those are good points, David. I think the, uh, I think political science is beginning to catch up. So yeah. I'm <laughs> slightly characterizing, yeah. mischaracterizing. IR in particular, um, but I, the but the harder point I think is your point about what can you do ex ante? Well, how how do you predict? And you know there are various scales that uh, you can uh, uh, give to leaders to say here are the characteristics, and then do you fall in this or that category? I don't know that any of those scales have been all that sort of convincingly effective. There have been. There have been experts. There, there have been efforts to do um, history in which people have said, "Here are the characteristics of leaders," and then go back and look historically at what they were doing over longer periods, including domestic policy as well as foreign policy, uh, and they come out uh, moderately decent fit. And um, part of the problem, I think, frankly, is that the terminology that we use in leadership theory, which goes back to James McGregor Burns, is very inadequate terminology. I mean, the, the, we're stuck with it because it's become widely used, but as the prior questioner indicated, it's really not, not very helpful. It, it fails to distinguish uh, the word transformational, as used to, and defined by Burns, fails to distinguish two different dimensions. What are the leader's objectives? 
to make change or not make change. Then you can scale that out. And what's the leader's style? To inspire or not to inspire? And uh, you can presumably scale that as well. But the, the by compressing <coughs> these two dimensions into one word, uh, you can get to the strange situation that sometimes you have a leader who's uh, inspirational in style, but relatively modest or objective. Bill Kemp is an example. And uh, so I think the terminology that Burns bequeathed to leadership studies has been not very helpful. And part of what I argue in this, in this book, I didn't want to rehearse all that uh, here. I wanted to just get to the story, so to speak. But the, one of the early chapters critiques the, the terms and says that you really don't want to take these terms too seriously because they're going to muddle the terms. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with you on that. But, but and I also think you're right that, that political science is beginning to get beyond this. Yeah. Yes. Thank okay. you. Um, so uh, I think you've convincingly showed us through your use of counterfactuals that leaders do matter, right? That they matter at these crucial moments and they've mattered for shifting the U.S. in terms of its, its, its direction as, as becoming stronger or weaker. But I want to um, go back to Professor Waltz. And, and if I remember my theories of international politics, um, I think at one point he says something like, I'm not interested in explaining foreign policy. That would be like explaining you know, a leaf falling from the sky, the specific path. I'm instead explaining gravity, right? He, he never lacked for hubris uh, in yes. his, you know, <laughs> uh, which is one of the reasons we all love the book. But I wonder, when you think back about all these different episodes, do these leaders actually come to the point of really explaining big shifts, the kinds of shifts that <coughs> Waltz, right, wants to talk about? Or are they really sort of mattering because they were transactional versus transformational in a particular foreign <coughs> policy episode? How should we think about that? And I was thinking about W as being transformational and potentially truly shifting America's uh, sort of trajectory in the world. But you guys assure us that, mm -hmm. in fact, American decline is, is not happening. <laughs> but there were certainly people that would argue that, you know, if Gore had won and we hadn't had W, the U.S. would be on a much stronger path uh, in the world at the moment. So how do you think about that? Well, on the, on the last point, uh, would, uh, what difference did W make? I think he uh, changed perceptions more than the reality. Yeah. I think the underlying... Yeah. The underlying um, yeah. the, the but structure still. I mean, he didn't change the structure all that right. much. But um, but the interesting question is your first question, and it's it's a hard one. The, I test. I put this to myself in the book because mm -hmm. I say, can you imagine? Uh, not that things would have been a little bit different if this one or that one had been president, mm -hmm. but can you imagine that if one of these people hadn't been president, president? that the United States would not have been the dominant power at the end of the 20th century. Right. So you could right. say there's agency within structure, and that's easy sure. to show that agency, yeah. that's foreign policy yeah. versus structure. But to go back to your point about uh, Waltz, it's all structure, you have to ask not just does it affect foreign policy, but did the foreign policy then affect the structural outcome? Right. And I think, and in the book, I, I give the example of Franklin Roosevelt Mm -hmm. and uh, World War II. Yeah. If, I mean, if, if Bruce Rutzig's book, in which he posits a world based purely on realist analysis, I mean, there's no, no idealism in the book mm -hmm. or anything, just as on realist analysis, you can make a good case mm -hmm. that we should have let Hitler and Stalin fight it out, let them exhaust each other, mm -hmm. uh, then you wouldn't have had Soviets in the center of Europe, mm -hmm. You would have had some agreement between the a balance between the Soviets and the and the uh, uh, Germans, and that would have prevented them from the Germans from getting into the Western Hemisphere, which is what <coughs> Roosevelt was worried about. And uh, so they would have fought themselves to a standstill, exhausted themselves, and uh, we, the United States, could have saved all our treasure and all those lives, and uh, we didn't have to do that. And the interesting, and that, and Russet mm -hmm. makes this case as a relatively plausible hypothesis. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, 
I don't agree with it, but it's not a, a fantastical type of argument. What's interesting is that if, if Charles Lindbergh had been president, you could imagine somebody coming in to, you could imagine Russell coming in to advise Lindbergh and saying, let them fight it out. Don't, don't go for one or the other, let them fight it out. And, you, and if that had been Lindbergh as president, he might have accepted that. And then at the end of World War II, or maybe World War II would have lived along for quite some time longer, uh, you would have had a tripolar world, or a multipolar world. The US and the Western Hemisphere, um, the Soviets and the uh, Nazis dividing Europe, and I suppose a Japanese empire in the, in the, uh, you know, the Great East Asia Protox very city. So it probably been a quadrupolar, multipolar world. And um, Roosevelt didn't buy that. Roosevelt, Roosevelt thought Hitler is a threat to us, and if we don't stop him, it's, it's, you know, we're at great peril. So the fact that this leader had this view and then was able to prepare a reluctant people <coughs> so that when an attack occurred, he got the response that he wanted as opposed to a lot of dawdling and fussing. Um, I think Roosevelt made a different structural you can make a further argument. I, I, this is, I'm a little bit less sure of. If Wallace had been uh, president in uh, uh, 45 and uh, not Truman, the first two years Truman actually doesn't crack down hard in the Cold War. He's relatively soft. He's trying to follow Roosevelt's policy. But by 47, uh, he, he says, damn it, all these guys are cheating. You know, we're, we're not going to put up with this. And, and so he starts to toughen the position. It's conceivable that Wallace would not have. In other words, that Wallace, Wallace would have stayed with illusions of what Stalin was after for far longer. And in that case, the world would probably have been bipolar structurally, in the sense that the, that the Europeans, the, the Japanese are devastated, the European great powers were, were prostate after the, the war. But the Soviets might have become stronger mm -hmm. sooner. And that, that might have led to a, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a longer period of bipolarity. But I, I'm less certain of that second argument than I am of the, of the first. But sometimes foreign policy, I think, can affect structure. And that is, but you're right, that's the real test. Maybe squeeze in one last quick question. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Way down the end. <laughs> Well, I, it, it's an interesting question. And the last chapter of the book tries to answer, tries to address that question, which is, what does all this mean for the 21st century? And I argue that um, we shouldn't be pressing leaders for grand visions as much as we should be pressing them to understand the way the world is changing and to create a set of structures which play to our strengths so that we maintain the position we have. So. The kind of debates you have about you know real return to the American 20th century, you know that's not going to happen. But the kind of debate that says, well, we're in decline, so we might as well adjust to it. I don't. That needn't happen either. That goes back to Bob's earlier point. And so what I argue in the book is develop a clear understanding of how to leverage your strengths, and that's going to mean that in a world in which China is rising, India is rising, others. Uh, maintaining your alliances with Europe and Japan is going to make, take, remain important. And uh, also the ability to develop networks which cut across different blocks and groups. Uh, and because we'll be the center of these networks, which will give us an extra position. In other words, there, there are a whole series of things that you can do which are not dramatic crusades but which can maintain American strength and position. And uh, so the, the, what 
what I conclude in the last chapter for the 21st century is don't get transfixed with transformation. Uh, <laughs> focus on how do you make sure that we use the strengths we have to uh, remain true to center cards. I do. Well, I, I suspect in the last half a, uh, hour and a half or so, you've you've sold several dozen <laughs> copies, <laughs> copies of your book, yeah. or put some people to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think so. And and um, I, for one, very much look forward to reading it, as I'm sure do many others. So, thank you very much for spending the time with us. Thank you.